Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. In just a minute, we'll be in verse 1 and following. And uh, boy, I'm enjoying Isaiah, my 14th sermon from this book. And we're working our way through it. It's the prophetic book in the Old Testament. And it's very interesting. The text we're in today is perfect for the Lord's Supper. We planned the Lord's Supper a while back, and the Lord planned to have Isaiah 42 uh, ready to go. Jesus, the Lord's servant. You know, Jesus did not come as a king to sit on an earthly throne. He did not come as a politician to have a particular partisan platform. He didn't come to establish a new religion. He didn't come as a philosopher, although he could have, uh, to teach at a university. He didn't come as an author to publish books. He didn't come as a general to lead an earthly army. He didn't come as an entrepreneur and a businessman to uh, have silver and gold. Jesus, the Son of God, came as a humble, lowly, suffering servant with one primary goal, to please God and to do his Father's will. And for that to happen, he had to come and die on a cross, as Brother Mark said a while ago, and to rise from the dead to give us salvation. He came as a servant. He came as a servant. So today, I want us to look at the Lord's servant. First thing is, Jesus is the Lord's spirit-filled servant. He is the Lord's spirit-filled servant. Look at verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold. This is God the Father speaking about his son. My chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. All across the Old Testament, the Messiah is referred to as the servant. Many times as the suffering servant. And of course, as Christians, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. He is Isaiah's servant, his spirit-filled servant, he says here. Look at that verse. It says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. Now, when did that happen? Now, Jesus, obviously, we'll see in just a moment, was conceived in the womb of Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. But when did his ministry start, and when did the Holy Spirit come upon him, Epirchomai, come upon him to minister in the power of the Lord? You know, he was God, but he was man, and so he had to be anointed with the Holy Spirit to have that kind of ministry. When did that happen? At his baptism. Let me just read it to you from Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. And by the way, if you don't believe in the Trinity, you have a hard time with these, te- these verses. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. There it is. In bodily form. While he was praying, the Spirit of God came down upon him. Don't miss that. People who pray have an anointing of the Holy Spirit that people who don't pray don't have. While he was praying, the Spirit of God came upon him in the bodily form like a dove, and a voice came to he- out of heaven. Praying people hear the voice of God more than people that don't pray. You're my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What's that? That's encouragement. That's affirmation. And praying people get more affirmation from the Lord than people who don't. But Jesus was anointed at his baptism. In fact, when Peter was preaching, He was talking to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. He said, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus was and is the eternal divine Son of God in the flesh. He is coexistent eternally with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and he's anointed by the Spirit He is anointed by the Spirit. He was anointed, by the way, his mother was anointed by the Holy Spirit when she conceived him. We read in Luke 1, 35, Gabriel said to Mary, 
She said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. How can I have a baby? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Same word in Acts 1.8. Come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Come upon you and for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So Jesus was born by the power of the Spirit. Jesus was anointed to preach by the Holy Spirit and minister. Every miracle he ever performed was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every sermon he ever preached was by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit he has now given to us. Acts 1.8, you, you Christians out there, you shall receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit, what? Comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And we're told to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled. Be ye continually filled with the Holy Spirit of God. People ask me sometimes, well, you're a Baptist. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? <laughs> yes. Yes. I was born again by the Spirit, born of the Spirit. I was filled with the Holy Spirit many times and hopefully I'm filled with the Spirit right now. And one bapti baptism in the Holy Spirit at conversion and multiple fillings on and on. And that's what all of us are experiencing, not just preachers. And Jesus is the Spirit-filled, Lord's Spirit-filled servant. He's also the Lord's selfless servant. Look at verse 2. Jesus was the most humble, selfless person ever to live. He walked in humility. Look at verse 2. He will not cry out or raise his voice and make his voice heard in the street. He won't be obnoxious. We could use a little bit of that in our nation, could we not? We need some people who are not crying out, raising their voice, not making their voices heard in the street. Jesus didn't boast. He didn't brag. He didn't call attention to himself. He didn't protest out in the streets. He didn't preach loudly on the street corner. He taught calmly in the synagogues and in the temple. He didn't make a scene. He didn't exalt himself. He never exalted himself. He always humbled himself. Look at verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break. And a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Now what is that all about? People who are hurting, who have sinned, who have messed up in their lives are like a bruised reed. And they don't need to be broken. They need to be ministered to and loved on. Our world is harsh. Let's don't be like our world. Let's be loving to sinners. Everybody in here knows that what I'm about to say is true. We're all sinners. You say, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. There's not a person in this room that will want everything you've thought about and said and done in the last five years to be put up on these screens. If everybody knew everything about everybody, nobody would like anybody. <laughs> Amen. Get off your high horse and come down with the rest of us. Sinners saved by the grace of God. <laughs> just a thought. We're just a bunch of bruised reeds. Look to your neighbor and say, hello, bruised reed. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and he will not break us. Praise God. A dimly burning wick. Oh, we think we're all lit up. We're just dimly burning. We're that little candle that the wax is about to gulf it up. It just got one little bitty, little bitty flame on it. But Jesus loves us and he comes to us and he doesn't blow us out. He faithfully brings forth justice. Didn't he do that in his ministry? Didn't he minister to broken, hurting people? Isn't that what the church is called to do? We're not a museum for saints. We are a hospital for sinners. And people in our church are going to do nutty things sometimes. They're going to do sinful things sometimes. So do we just...
throw them to the wind or do we go to them and lovingly confront them and say, hey, this is not the way to go and minister to them. Isn't that what Jesus did for you and for me? Jesus touched people with leprosy and healed them. Jesus refused to cast the first stone at the immoral, adulterous woman. Jesus went to the house of tax gatherers when that was forbidden for all the Jews. All the social outcasts came to Jesus. The sinners by multitude were coming to hear Jesus preach. He dealt kindly yet firmly with their mess and all of us are messy. Ministry is messy. And Jesus just gets in our mess, doesn't he? And he makes us, he cleans us up and he helps us to move on. Pulls us out of the miry clay. Those who were like bruised reeds, he refused to break and he would not blow out the dimly burning wicks. He faithfully will bring forth justice. How? By justifying them, by saving them. Verse 4, he will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. The coastlands, that is the lost people, will wait expectantly for his law. Jesus is the selfless servant. He comes not to beat up on you, but to love you and love you enough to tell you the truth about what you're doing and saying that's not right, follow me. But he pulls you out with grace, does he not? He doesn't act harshly to you. He's the selfless servant. Thirdly, Jesus is the saving servant. Look at verse 5. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. God created the earth. We did not evolve from a lower form of life. The earth didn't randomly just show up out of nothing. These atheists and evolutionists tell me I've got faith to believe that God created the earth. They're the ones with the faith to believe that everything came out of nothing. I, I ain't got enough faith to do that. Everything didn't come out of nothing. Everything came from a someone named God. God spoke it into existence. He created the heavens and stretched them out. He spread out the earth and its offspring who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. God created people. Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. We didn't come from some tadpole. I don't have that much faith. That whole thing is just so surreal. I mean, you got to believe that there was just this little bitty speck of a thing that just started multiplying on its own and somehow over billions of years, that, that's what, billions of years, billions of years. Oh, anything can happen billions of years. I don't think so. You, you know, you, you got one little cell thing and it just creates all these things and all of a sudden grows legs and, and because it goes up to the shore and looks out and said, I think I'd like to walk on the seashore a while. And it just comes back in a couple of billions of years with legs, you know, and all of a sudden starts walking out there and it's kind of hot. And it said, well, I don't like this. So it goes back in the water and billions of years later comes up with two legs and it comes up and it stands up and then it goes to the, the beach and it, it likes the beach so it eliminates the tail. And so, you know, they just billions of years later it becomes a professor to teach all this. <laughs> you know, how, how, can, how can you deal with it? They tell me I've got faith. <laughs> They're the ones with faith. Then he says in verse 6, I'm the one who called you in righteousness. I've called you in righteousness. I also will hold you by the hand. I'll watch over you. I'll appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. Jesus, the Son of God, called us in righteousness. God held Jesus by the hand, watched up over him. And God performed a new covenant to the people of God. 
And look at that new covenant. Look at verse 7. To open blind eyes. How many of you can say with John Newton, I once was blind, but now I see? Anybody can say that? Yeah. To open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon. How many of you were a prisoner in a dungeon, but God set you free? Amen? Amen. And those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I've come out of the darkness. I've come out of the dungeon. I've come out of the blindness, just like you. When Jesus called my name, called me, when I wasn't looking for him, he was looking for me. Oh, praise God for his salvation. And there's only salvation in one person. Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You say, well, what does that mean? It means what it says. He is the only way to salvation. You can't be saved through any other religion. You don't get saved through religion. You get saved through Jesus Christ, a person. Muhammad is not a savior. At best, a confused man. All these other religions, that, that's not the way to God. It's Jesus. He's the only way to God. If you don't, come to Jesus, you don't know God. If you don't come through Jesus, you don't go to heaven. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but through me. The apostles believed it so much that they would be willing to be imprisoned for it. They got put in jail. They were brought before the Sanhedrin. They said in Acts 4.12, we're not going to back down. There's salvation in no one else. For there's no other name, oh, praise his name. There's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Paul was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was stoned, he was treated terribly, he was run out of, you think you've had a bad day? <laughs> what are you gonna say to Paul? Well, they talked bad about me. Well, bless your little heart. <laughs> did, what did he think about the saving only through Jesus, being saved only through Jesus. He said, Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's only one God. And there's only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. Would you be saved today? You gotta come to Jesus. Bellevue can't save you. No preacher can save you. Adrian Rogers can't save you. R.G. Lee can't save you. Ramsey Pollard can't save you. Steve Gaines can't save you. But Jesus can save you. And if you will repent, if you'll turn from your sins, and say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for my sins. And if you'll repent and turn to him and then say to the Lord, Lord, I believe that what you did on that cross, when you died, you died for my sins. You paid the penalty. I believe that is what saves me. I believe that you were buried. I believe you were raised from the dead. And I believe that you are alive. You've got to believe those two things. And then you've got to receive him. And when you do that, you say, Lord, I call upon the name of the Lord and I'm saved. Have you ever done that? Could we just stop right now and let you do it right now? Let's just bow our heads just a moment. If you'd like to pray to receive Christ, I saw a wedding here yesterday. They said vows to one another. Say your vow to the Lord. Say something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to be saved right now. I, I want to know you as my Savior. I repent. I turn from my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. I believe that you are the only Savior. I believe you died for my sin. You rose from the dead. I receive you. Save me right now. Oh, come into my life. I call on your name. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's thank God that Jesus is the Lord's saving servant. Amen. Amen. 
Fourthly, Jesus is the Lord's superior servant. Look at verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. I won't give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Now, they were worshiping these idols that had to be nailed down so they wouldn't fall over. Isn't that something that you want to really worship? <laughs> I mean, they made it. He'll say later on, he said, they took a, a tree, they cut down a tree. For some of it, they put it in their oven and they cooked some food. Then they put it in their fire and they warmed themselves. They took some other of it and made an idol out of it. Now, do you see how ridiculous that is? And we have idols. We worship things besides God. But he said, I'm not going to give my glory to another. I'm superior to all graven images. Verse 9, behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. And I want to say this is a word to somebody today. Every time I read this verse, I know that this gives hope to people God would say to you today, you don't have to live in your past. Did you hear that song that Bethany was saying a while ago? God can evaporate your past. He can just say, okay, let's do over. Let's have a do. How many of you ever want a do over? Anybody out there? Yeah. You got, got any things that you wish you could do over and you can't just give it to God. He can give you a do over. Behold, the former things have come to what? Pass. They're past now. Now I declare new things before they spring forth, I proclaim the new. God knows the beginning from the end. God knows what's out there. God knows the future better than we know the present, all right? He's saying here that this new covenant is coming and it's going to replace the old covenant. Judaism is going to be replaced by Christianity. It's no longer keeping the law it's going to be serving the Christ and loving him. And here's a new song of salvation in Christ. Verse 10, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and those who dwell on, that is the lost people out there, the people that are out in the wilderness. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices. The settlements where Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. There's a new covenant coming. There's a new song that's going to be sung. It's about Jesus Christ. What the old covenant could never do, Christ has come to do. Romans 8, 3 through 4. For what the law could not do, Paul says, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Jesus fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah, and he has given us a new covenant that is superior to the old covenant and to Judaism. Jesus is the Lord's superior servant. One more thing. Jesus is the spirit-filled servant. He's the selfless servant. He's the saving and the superior servant. But Jesus is also the successful servant. Look at verse 13. His role as God's servant is what God used to conquer Satan and sin. Jesus' crucifixion looked like a terrible defeat, but it was the biggest victory ever and he is the Lord's successful servant. Look at verse 13. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail over and against his enemies. Now, we don't like to talk about God as a warrior, but he is a warrior. Jesus is a warrior. Jesus fought the greatest battle ever on the cross. Hell can't handle Jesus. The devil can't handle Jesus. The grave couldn't hold Jesus. Death couldn't harm Jesus. He was raised on that first Easter morning. He uttered a shout. He raised a war cry. He prevailed against all his enemies. Can we just praise him for that right now and give him glory? Amen. Then God says in verse 14, 
I've kept my silent long, a long time. You know, isn't there, isn't there something about God? How many of you know that sometimes God is just kind of silent? Does anybody know that? And it bothers us sometimes. You know, we're praying, God, I need an answer. I need it now. God never gets on our timetable, does he? He's got his own timetable. That's why we need to get on his. And when God doesn't answer you immediately, don't worry about that. He's moving. He's moving. I've kept silent for a long time. I've kept still, restrained myself. Now like a woman in labor, I will groan. I will both gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and the hills and wither all their vegetation. I'm going to make the rivers into coastlands and dry up the ponds. Yet while he was punishing sin and sinners, he would also protect and pave the way for his people. Look at verse 16. I will lead the blind by a way they don't know and paths they don't know. I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do. I will not leave them undone. Everyone who worshiped idols would be punished. Look at verse 17. They will be turned back and be utterly put to shame who trust in idols, who say to molten images, you are God's. Then God the Father bragged on Jesus, the Christ, his su successful servant, and also on all those who listened to Jesus and obeyed him and followed him. Look at verse 18. Hear you deaf and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? Talking about Jesus, or so deaf as my messenger whom I send. Who is so blind as he that is at peace with me, or so blind as the servant of the Lord? Then the Lord condemns his people who have rejected him. I want to say this to you. You can be a Christian and stop walking with God and not be on God's good side. And that's what he's, he's talking. He's refusing. These are people who refuse to obey the Lord, who have followed the Lord at one time. Look at verse 20. You have seen many things, but you don't observe them. Your ears are open, but nobody hears. The Lord has, was pleased for his righteousness sake to make the law great and glorious. But this is a people plundered and despoiled. All of them are trapped in caves. They are hidden away in prisons. They become a prey with none to deliver them and a spoil with none to say, give them back. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will give heed and listen hereafter? Who gave Jacob up for spoil and Israel to plunderers? Was it not the Lord? I want to tell you something. God will allow, when we're living in sin as Christians, God will allow pagans to be what he uses to discipline us. Who gave Jacob up for spoil and Israel to plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned and in whose ways they were not willing to walk and in whose law they did not obey? So he poured out on on him the heat of his anger and the fierceness of battle and it set him aflame all around. Yet he did not recognize it. He, it burned him, but he paid no attention. In time, God would send Judah into Babylonian captivity. After 70 years, they would come out of that and they would go back to the land of Israel. Nevertheless, though they were for the most part un, unfaithful and un, disobedient to the Lord Jesus, served and pleased God like Israel never did. And even though Israel disobeyed the Lord, the Messiah did not. And Jesus is the Lord's successful servant. Not long after or before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus' disciples, especially James and John, were arguing over who was the greatest among them. Can you imagine that? Jesus is about to die. He's talking about his death and resurrection, and they're saying, who's the greatest among us? I know that you're about to die, but who's the greatest among us? And James and John even asked if in heaven they could sit on the right and left side of Jesus when he was on the throne. Jesus rebuked them for their self-centeredness. He said these famous words, Mark 10 42 through 45. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it's not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. 
And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be the slave of all. Now look at verse 45. Read it with me, please, off the screen. Would you please? Good and slow. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve. You want a ministry? Start serving other people. You want to have a life that is filled with joy? Start serving other people. Get your mind off of yourself and get your mind on the Lord and other people. Your greatness as a Christian is directly determined on how much you serve the Lord and how much you serve other people. You want to be great in God's kingdom? Be like Jesus. What's Jesus like? He's a servant. He's the Lord's spirit-filled servant, his selfless servant, his saving servant, his superior servant. And Jesus is the Lord's successful servant. And he did it all through a bloody cross and an empty tomb. 